morning, everybody. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to log on. I'm running just a minute late, but we are here and we are ready. Um, so we'll start in just a few minutes. Got one watcher out there, maybe Emily. There we go, we're getting a few more watchers. Sorry to be a minute late in getting started. We will uh, wait just a minute or two more. I think Emily is hooking us up to the website. And then we will get going. Welcome, by the way, to my backyard. I'm so glad to have you all over today. you're out there, do throw me a comment just so I know who, uh, who is in the room. Our count is going up and down of watchers.
right. If you are here watching, please uh, shoot me a quick note in the comments field so I know who we're talking to, and I will try and uh, keep up with y'all. Steve Schott, welcome. Robert, it is not just you and me today. We've got at least 14 people with us at the moment, and we are going to study the second half of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapters 3 and 4. All right, uh, if you would, please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we'll start there. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, I'm posting a link in the comments field to a place that you can access the full text of the Bible. And I recommend that you use the New Revised Standard Version. But, of course, any version uh, will do just fine. Oh, Ann Fisher, good morning. Marion, good morning. Carol, good morning. I'm so glad everyone's here. As I mentioned, we're gathering today because it's such a lovely spring morning in my backyard, and I'm so glad to have you all here uh, as we practice social distancing. One administrative note. Um, usually we take off the Thursday of Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, um, but given our irregular year, I'm going to recommend that we do meet next Thursday at 10 o'clock, and in honor of the Monday, Thursday holiday, we will study the Monday, Thursday story. So we're going to finish up Philippians today, and then uh, next Thursday we will study uh, Monday, Thursday on Monday, Thursday, and then we'll carry forward at least through April um, with Bible study on Thursdays at 10. I'm so glad you're here. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, these are uncertain times. These are unfamiliar times. But you are the God who speaks to us in the midst of uncertainty, and who comes to impose order on chaos. Your word has spoken to generations of Christians before in complicated times. Grant that it might speak to us today, just as it spoke to them, and that it may inspire us to live the lives that you would have us live. Come and be with us. Reveal yourself in a new way to us today, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let God's people say amen in the comments field. We are beginning with uh, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, today. Philippians, chapter 3. If you're flipping through your Bible, Philippians is tucked in between Ephesians and Colossians. It's a short little note, uh, four uh, chapters only, so it's easy to miss. As we know, all of the letters attributed to Paul are organized by length, not by content or by chronology. So they are, you'll find Philippians towards the end of the list, between Ephesians and and Colossians. You'll remember uh, from our study last week that St. Paul has been writing to this church that he founded, writing to Christians uh, who are there. Uh, he's moved on from them, um, but he has a special affection for them. And we met uh, Paul in, excuse me, Paul met the Philippians in Acts. It is in Philippi where uh, Lydia came into our memory. It's in Philippi where Paul was in jail and there was the earthquake and the cell doors fell open, but he remained in jail so he could continue his witness to the guards who were around him. So Philippi has a special place in his heart. He has moved on, uh, but the people in Philippi are starting to run into trouble. And so he's writing back to them, giving them advice on how they should live the Christian life. And his major advice so far is to take heart and to remain firm in their faith and to remember everything that he taught them and to remember that God loves them and he loves them, and to stay the course. That's roughly the first two chapters, and we begin to read today in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I'm actually going to stop right there uh, after that one... Um, uh, one uh, note, just to because it's the critical theme for Philippians. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Um, in the original Greek, it is not brothers and sisters. It's simply brothers, but we've updated that. 
And in this one sentence, we get the whole core theme of the um, letter to the Philippians, be joyful. That's going to come back to us in chapter four, which we'll see in a few minutes. Carrying on, Philippians chapter three and verse one. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome for me, and for you it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What is Paul saying here? Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. What Paul is trying to do is introduce the idea that salvation comes through acceptance of Jesus Christ and a relationship with Jesus Christ, to use more modern language. And once we have accepted Christ and once we are in Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, as we discussed in the letter to the Galatians. So since there is no longer Jew or Greek, all of those Jewish practices, circumcision, um, presentation of children, all of those Jewish practices are not important anymore because what really matters is being in Christ. So Paul says, beware of those who would mutilate the flesh. Beware of those who tell you that circumcision is required. Why should we beware of these people? We should beware of these people because they have added something to the core message that Paul is teaching. Paul says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, period, paragraph, end of story. Don't take anything more. Well, someone might say to Paul, you just, you, um, you're completely wrong. These Jewish credentials matter so much. And he answers that by listing out his own credentials. Remember that Paul was born a Jew. He was a persecutor of Christians when he was a Jew. He lists off all of his credentials. I was circumcised. I'm from the right family. Um, I was trained under the law. I'm one of those Pharisees who was asking Jesus all the difficult questions. Um, I was, um, uh, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I was out there persecuting the church in, uh, in uh, obedience to the Jewish authorities. I am Jewish. I have all the credentials that I need to be Jewish. And what I'm saying to you is that none of that matters. It's a really powerful statement. And if we start thinking about it in a modern context, we can ask ourselves, what are the modern credentials that don't matter or wouldn't matter for Paul? I've been to seminary. I've been ordained. I have gone to the same church and sat in the same pew for 50 years. Paul would say that none of that matters. Once you're in Christ, we're all one. No Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, all are one. No regular churchgoer and non-regular churchgoer. No sinner, non-sinner. No pious or non-pious, no ordained or not ordained, no generous or not generous. Either you're in Christ or you're not in Christ. It's a binary condition and nothing else matters. That's the argument that Paul is making. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh, not because it's a bad practice, but because it's not necessary. The only thing that's necessary is being in Christ. If you leave a comment on the side, I'm glad to respond as I can. Uh, Ann Fisher, yes, we do have many happy birds over here in Midtown. We also have many happy people, and that's what matters most. Don and Carol, welcome. Let's carry on with Paul's argument here, looking at chapter 3 and verse 7. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> Do you notice that as I read Paul's words in a proclamation voice, the sun comes out behind me to backlight me? Know that the Lord is on our side as we engage this study. In this last paragraph, Paul expands on the argument that he had made before. Everything I had gained in my previous life, I have come to count as loss. I count it as rubbish. All of the credentials, all of the authority, all of the um, claims that I could make, and I just made earlier in the chapter, all of that, I've come to regard not as gain, but as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing value of the love of Jesus Christ, my Savior. The surpassing value of the love of Jesus Christ, my Savior. If you have a Bible in front of you, underline that passage the surpassing value. The love of Christ and our possession by Christ surpasses everything for Paul. He keeps bringing us back to what modern credentials, what modern possessions would we hold up above our faith? Paul would say we have to knock all of that down. The only thing that matters is being in Christ and knowing the surpassing love of Christ By sharing in his sufferings, Paul says in chapter 3, verse 10, by becoming like him in death, I may obtain the resurrection to eternal life. Christ suffered. In the, in the hymn that we had earlier in Philippians, it said he emptied himself. He did not regard even equality with God as something to be exploited, but took the form of a slave. If we're willing to do that, then we will suffer with Christ we will die with Christ, but more importantly, we will rise with Christ. A little bit earlier in the letter, Paul gave us that argument that he made of the Christian's goal is to be with Christ, therefore shouldn't he make haste and die so that he can go on to heaven and be with Jesus? But he said that the work is below, the work is for you, Philippians. It's of more value for me to stay here, and so he does. He suffers here. He will die here, and because of his suffering, he will rise with Christ in glory. It's a beautiful image, and one that we can all commend for our reflection. Just a little bit more, beginning chapter 3 and verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this, or have already reached the goal. I'm going to pause there. That to attain this, the this, the pronoun, refers back to suffering with Christ and ultimately dying with Christ so that he can rise with Christ. Not that I have already obtained this goal or have reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. I haven't attained it yet. I haven't reached perfection in my faith life, but I press on. And I make that my goal, that Christ would be my own. Why do I make that my goal? Because Christ has made me his own. This is so connected to what we learned about in Galatians, where he said that nothing matters, nothing matters, except the love of Jesus Christ and our ownership by Christ, our slavery to Christ. Nothing else matters. Chapter 3 and verse 13. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behead, behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the heavenly call. Do you want to make a guess as to what comes next? I press on towards the goal of the heavenly prize, which is the call 
of Jesus. It's church class. If you're asked a question, uh, Jesus is always a good answer. We would have gotten a little laughter in our classroom, but these are strange times and I'm here by myself, so I'm going to give myself the laugh. Ha ha ha, Father Sandy, you're so funny. Thank you. I press on towards the goal of the heavenly call of God in Christ. Verse 15. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal it to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Be of the same mind. We've heard that before, haven't we? Earlier on in Philippians, he said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Be of the same mind. Let that mind be of Christ. And then you'll have no need for arguing or quarreling or anything else. Let the mind be in you that was in Christ. And verse 16, only let us hold fast to what we have attained. <clears throat> let us not lose ground. Let us not lose the teachings that I have given you and the practices that we developed. Let us hold fast to what we have attained. Take a look at verse 17, chapter 3 and verse 17. Brothers and sisters, in the original Greek brothers, updated here for um, inclusive language, join in intimidating me and observe those who live according to the example that you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've often told you about them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. I'm going to pause there before we get the next um, piece. Join in imitating me. Um, I'm not ever sure I've shown you my Bible, but this is the Bible I used in seminary when I was a student. And I wrote notes in the margin. And you'll see right here when Paul says, join in imitating me, I have made a little note. Pride? Pride? Is Paul telling us that he is the model? In fact, he's not. And now, 10 years into ministry, I can critique my seminary self and say Paul is not being prideful. Paul is writing to people who he feels have lost their way. And what he is saying is, look, I taught you this faith. I taught you about this Jesus fellow. We talked about it when I was with you. You are forgetting some of the things we talked about. And what I'd like for you to do is start imitating me. Imitate me, because that will teach you how it is that you're supposed to live. What is the way that we should imitate him? Suffering with Christ so that we might die with Christ, so that we could rise with Christ. Keeping in us the same mind that was in Jesus Christ, so that we don't have need to quarrel or to argue. If you've lost your way, my children, follow me. I'll show you. Imitate me and we together will suffer and die with Christ, but we together will rise with Christ. It's a beautiful love story, isn't it, or a love letter. Paul writing back to people that he just cares about so much, wants to help them find their way. The people that he is holding up as the uh, opposite example, the people not to follow, he has some comments about them. He says, I've told you about these people. They're enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly. Their glory is in their shame. And then he sums up all of those things. Their minds are set on earthly things. Their God is the belly, a metaphor for self-satisfaction, for being full, for being, um, um, for being overstuffed. Their end is destruction. What they're working towards is not something that leads to life. It's something that leads to death. He's trying to point out the folly of the people who are there. And the problem that Paul has is that those false teachers, those enemies of the cross, those who would say, you don't need to suffer and die with Christ, you can live just fine right now, those people are there. And Paul is not there. 
And so he has to write back to them to persuade them to follow his teachings, not theirs. It's a tough message. You can think what the tempting offers might be. Oh, don't worry about giving all of your money to the poor. Don't worry about that. Live comfortably. Take it easy. Don't, don't worry about what Paul says, that it's all about the conversion of the heart and ownership of Christ. Here are some religious practices, and if you do these religious practices, then you're going to be fine. That's what all of our ancestors believed. I've taught a class a couple of times on the heresies, and what I've suggested is that the heresies are dangerous because they made sense. The arguments of the false teachers, the people that Paul identifies as the enemies of the cross, those people's arguments make sense. And Paul has to knock them down because they are there making sensible arguments that are leading people away from Christ. I'd ask the question, who around us is making a sensible argument that's leading us ultimately away from Christ, away from our faith? Just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's a good idea. The claims of faith also make sense, and they're a better idea. Before we move on, I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Reverend Deacon Jerry uh, Endicott, who is uh, the um, deacon looking after St. Thomas Somerville, our partner church in Fayette County, one of our partner churches in Fayette County, and she has joined us. So, Jerry, welcome to the group. We pick up in uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And that is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who are reading in the New Revised Standard Translation, you'll see a translator's note next to um, the word citizenship. Citizenship is an important word. It's a belonging word. It's an identity word, a possession word. Our citizenship is in heaven. Imagine for a moment that you were living in Rome. Imagine that you're Paul who has the privilege of being a citizen of the Roman Empire. And that citizen of Rome is saying our citizenship is in heaven. It's a really big deal. It's a political statement. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is not America or Tennessee or Memphis. Our citizenship is Christ. If you look down at that translator's note, you're going to see that the alternate translation is commonwealth. Our commonwealth is in Christ. Our shared value, common wealth, is in Christ. I sort of like the word commonwealth better than citizen. Our shared value. Interesting little factoid, story time with Father Sandy. Four out of the 50 U.S. states are identified as commonwealths. They are Virginia and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and Kentucky. As you know, I grew up in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and in quite, we were quite proud to be called a commonwealth and not a state. Uh, the story goes, and I think it's probably accurate, that the Constitution of Virginia was written slightly before the Constitution in Massachusetts, and John Adams said if it's good enough for Virginia and Thomas Jefferson, it's good enough for John Adams and Massachusetts. But we're very proud of that. And one of the things, one of the core values around that word is this shared wealth, common wealth, shared value. We're in this together. We work together. And no one gets to succeed if any are failing. I think about that in terms of this social distancing that we're doing right now. It's tempting to cheat. It's tempting to go up to the church and gather you all together so that we can sit in classroom 301 that we waited so long for in that whole year that we were displaced to the bookstore. It's tempting to say, oh, you all are feeling fine and I'm feeling fine. Let's just get together. But we can't. We can't cheat or we're not going to, uh, we're not going to succeed. Either we all succeed or we all fail, but there's nothing in between. Our commonwealth is in Christ. Our citizenship, our identity, is in Christ. Continuing with chapter 3 and verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, 
And it is from there that we are expecting the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory, by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. He will for transform the body of our humiliation. He will transform the body that is in prison as Paul is in prison. He will transform the body that is suffering as Paul suffers with Christ and we need to suffer with Christ. He will transform the body that dies, that is subject to the powers of death. He will transform all of that because he loves us and because we are in Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation. And what will he transform it into? He will transform it into the body of his glory. The ascended Christ that death itself could not contain. That's the transformation that's coming for us. Transitioning into chapter 4. Therefore, You know the definition of an optimist. An optimist is someone who, when the preacher says, and in conclusion, believes him. We have Paul here making a transition. Therefore, in conclusion, finishing up, but he's still got a lot of material to go, so don't get distracted by his transition. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. The people that Paul has brought to faith are his joy and his crown. When he stands before the Lord, he is interested in how many people he can say he brought to faith and nothing more. Not the credentials, not the privilege, not the power. My joy and my crown are bringing you to faith. It's a beautiful pastoral statement that many clergy would do well to hear my joy and my crown are tending you to a life of faith, of holiness, of following Christ, and nothing more. Actually, I'll just go an aside here for a moment. Um, a lot of times clergy and churches define themselves by uh, numbers. How many persons worship on Sunday? How many members do you have? How many dollars did you receive? How big is the building? How large? was the campaign, how much progress has been made on construction. But Paul says his joy and his crown are the people he's brought to faith. That's a project that all of us can handle and pursue, and it's an inspiring one at that. Chapter 4 and verse 2. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Why should they be in the same mind? Because everybody should be in the same mind. Have the same mind in you that was in Jesus Christ that did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Euodia and Syntyche seem to be having some sort of disagreement, and Paul is saying, get over yourselves and move on. Let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus Christ. And yes, I ask you also, my loyal companion, um, you'll see in a footnote there that the, uh, there's a Greek name indicated there for my loyal companion. Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. All of these people have been brought to faith. Their names are written in the book. They are going to be redeemed by Christ. And we have a disagreement. And what does Paul say? Be of one mind, get over it. And then he asks the community to help them. Reach out to your brothers and sisters who are having a problem. Help them get through it. Help them find their way. Another beautiful statement. And then Philippians 4 and verse 4, something that those of you who worship regularly at Church of the Holy Communion will recognize. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
That is my post-Eucharistic blessing all of the times that I um, celebrate the Eucharist. It's an appointed one, but we expand it just a little bit for that wonderfully powerful phrase, be not anxious about anything. Most repeated phrase in all of Holy Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament combined, do not be afraid. God's people are not supposed to be afraid. Why? Because we suffer with Christ and we die with Christ and we rise again with Christ in glory. In these uncertain times, that message of not being afraid really comes into play. Are we going to be afraid? Are we going to be pushed by all of this news and all of the uncertainty and a disease that we don't understand, that's traveling around, that we can't see? Or are we going to rejoice in all things, as Paul asks us to do? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. If you didn't hear me the first time, I'm going to say it again. And because you're rejoicing, you don't have to be anxious about anything. Because we live in Christ. And Christ lives in us. And we are one. Make your request known to God, Paul says, with supplication and prayer and thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul says the answer to the prayer is going to be. Not make your request known to God and you'll get whatever you ask for. But make your request known to God with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. And God will receive all of that. And God will give you peace. God may not do exactly what you want, but God will give you peace. I've told this story before in this group that I had, um, when I was a student chaplain in seminary, and I, I had these questions about prayer. And I, we, my chaplaincy group was meeting with a physician who was known for praying with his patients. And so I was going to ask him my hard questions about prayer. And I was going to say, Doctor, why is it that you pray for a patient? Are you, do you believe that you could persuade God to do something that he otherwise might not do? And do we, are we to believe that if we get a lot of people to pray, God will be more inclined to answer the prayers of that group of people than he is to answer the prayers of one faithful person? And I laid out my question, and I was so proud. And that doctor looked back at me and said, Mr. Webb, you're asking entirely the wrong question. What, I thought? The wrong question? I've been working on those questions for years. And he says, the Bible says that we should pray. So we do. It's not up to us to manage the process. The Bible says that we should pray. So we do. And we trust that God will manage the process. The Bible says that we should pray, so we do. And what we get in return is peace. Prayer does not transform the heart of God. Prayer transforms the heart of the prayer by reconnecting ourselves to the power that is greater than ours and by reminding us of our right relationship with God, with him being big and us being small. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone because you don't have to compete over anything if Christ is in you. For the Lord is near. Be not anxious about anything, but in everything, everything, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God and God's peace, that peace that passes all understanding, will come and guard your heart. If you really pray sincerely, my friends, I hope you feel that peace. I hope you feel that presence of God saying it's going to be okay. We will suffer together. Someday we will die together. And someday then we will rise together in glory, transforming these humiliated bodies subject to death and illness and disease into resurrection bodies that will not look similar and that will be a pure reflection of the God who loves us and who refuses ever to let us go. You can see why I like that passage so much. 
Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Keep following my example, he comes back to again. Keep doing the things that I taught you to do. Keep rejecting people who would tell you to do something else. Be focused and move forward. Chapter 3 and verse 10. 4. Chapter 4 and verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, now that at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. Paul here is elaborating on the suffering that he referenced earlier in the chapter. What is it to suffer with Christ? Sometimes suffering with Christ means not having enough. It means making decisions that aren't in your financial best interest. And what Paul says is, I've learned how to do that. I've learned how to be well fed. I've learned how to be hungry. I've learned how to have plenty and I've learned how to have need. What's the strategy? What's the secret? Knowing that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things in Christ. This too is a beautiful teaching. As we transition to the next paragraph, you may start to notice that it's a bit of a stewardship letter as well. Paul says in 415, you Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no, ch no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that accumulates to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. The Philippians, <coughs> of all the churches that Paul founded, were the only ones who sent some money along to help advance his mission. It's one of those awkward points in conversation when we need to talk about the money that's necessary to fuel the church, and Paul brings it up right here in Philippians. He says, it's not that I uh, was wanting the profit, not that I wanted to have more money in my account, but the things that I was able to do with that money, the way that I was able to sustain my life so that I could continue on with my proclamation and my story. That, he says, is the Philippians' true gift, empowering him to do his work. When we think about church giving, it's important to remember that too. To what end are we making these sacrificial gifts? For what purpose? What's the mission? What will be the outcome? Not just that we give and give selflessly and give without condition, but that we give in a way that advances the kingdom of God, each of us to the extent of our own ability. I'm grateful to Paul for being willing to go there. At the end of this long letter that's encouraging the Philippians to have hope, he's willing to go there and talk about money and talk about it being necessary. Paul starts to wrap up in chapter 4 and verse 19. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches, riches in the glory according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Even in your giving, God will sustain will sustain your needs. You will never find yourself in need because we all suffer together, and we know that we're suffering in the direction of death and in the direction of resurrection. 
And then Paul gives us that great little doxology, to God be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. That obviously feels like the ending of the letter. <clears throat> There's a little bit more that gets tacked on, sort of a little postscript, a PS. Paul says in 421, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the emperor's household. The emperor's household. Paul is in a time when Christianity is illegal in Rome, and he is slowly, person by person, converting the emperor's household because he has the resources that the Philippians sent along. And then he concludes, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that, my friends, is St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. This uh, platform that we're using is a lot more of me talking than our usual discussions, but we'll be back to the normal soon. If you do have any thoughts or comments that you want to insert in the field, uh, we can bring those back up next week. Next Thursday is Maundy Thursday, and we are going to meet. We don't usually, but these are strange times. And I think that we'll be well served if we uh, study the um, Maundy Thursday story the institution of the Eucharist in the Synoptic Gospels, and the um, foot washing after supper in St. John's Gospel. So we'll be studying those texts next week. Um, I hope that you will um, observe a holy, holy week, even under these circumstances. You can expect correspondence later today from Holy Communion uh, laying out our plans for Holy Week. We have some really exciting things that are going to be going on and some creative ministry opportunities. Um, so stand by for that communication, uh, but please do be here with us for Bible study next Thursday at 10 o'clock Central Time as a part of your devotion as we study the Monday Thursday story. I love all of you more than I can say, and I miss you, um, but I'm so glad that we were able to be together even over this platform. May God bless you and continue to inspire you in his word. And my blessing for you today will be this. In the midst of all of this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is so near. Be not anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Look at all these wonderful names in the comments. Marilyn Arnsberg from Texas, welcome home. Carol, Debbie, Cindy, Robert, uh, Debbie Nelson, welcome. Uh, Jerry, Emily, Mike Watson, Joellen, we had a great crowd today. Thank you so, so much. Every blessing on all of you. Bye-bye.